the slides so welcome everyone That's a good point, actually. thank That's you point, and congratulations for making it in on the day of tube strikes it's a real planes trains and automobiles how did you do it trains walking <laughs> bikes i came in on a line bike this morning um it's great to see you and i'm really excited for this session so let me just say a few things before I introduce you to the chair of this panel. My name is Castro Melville. I'm the director of the Festival of Ideas. I take full responsibility for it. It's, I made it up based on things that I like and I'm interested in. So we started off with a jam session. We steamed down uh, playing with SOAS musicians in BGLT a couple of Saturdays ago. Uh, then we had Nikki Yo, the jazz pianist, coming in talking about improvisation, playing some of her music. We had a wonderful panel about the relationship between music and film. We had a two-day showcase of amazing research films made by my colleague Linda Adobe and her research team. Um, on Tuesday, we had a very special thing, which was a live podcasting recording. Uh, some of my students from podcasting class last year, Alex and others, um, did such a great job in the class that I invited them to record a second episode, which they did on Tuesday with a great... A uh, bunch of guests <coughs> played music and talked about diasporic music in London. Lots of crossover here, I hope you can see. And today um, we're going to be talking about dance. In a way, I think of this as the heart of the festival. We're on, we're on the sixth event out of 12, so it's literally bang in the middle, but also it's the closest to my heart. So I've programmed this whole event to be about thinking through music. And the idea is both that we think through music and what music means, but we also think about music as a kind of thinking as a way of orientating yourself to the world. And in my estimation, and in my history, music and dance are inextricable. I mean, I am a dancer. You wouldn't know necessarily to look at me. Um, I'm not a professional dancer. I may not even be a very good dancer. My partner doesn't think I am. I think I'm all right. But I think if you ask my friends um, where you would find me in the many, many clubs and concerts and things that I've been to over the years, the answer would always be on the dance floor. That's where I, that's my safe space that is also a place for me not which is not just a place to kind of let your hair down and relax but it's also a place to think it's a place to you know to bring your mind and body into synergy together and synchronize it and the music i was listening to i feel that in a, you know in order to understand it and feel it i really need to move and dance to it so that's kind of what i'm really interested in and i want and that's why i've got a panel wonderful panel together to talk about it but it's part of a kind of two-parter. So next week, next Thursday, we've got the DJ Summit. Here's the, here's, you'll see these posters around. So I've got uh, Lene Denise and, and Nabiha Iqbal, Colin Dale, techno legend, uh, Charlie Dark, and uh, Harold Heath talking about DJing. But to me, these two kind of go hand in hand. That would have been too big a panel to have them and these wonderful people. We've got DJs on this panel as well, by the way. And I think the conversation will lead you to understand that you can't really separate the two. I mean... I have always been struck by, if you go and see the great reggae <coughs> legend Burning Spear or the footage I've seen of the great jazz pianist Thelonious Monk, while they're making music, they will suddenly, Monk used to get up from his keyboard and dance. And people thought he was weird. But I completely understood it because it was, it was him doing the same thing as he was doing at the piano but using his body to express it. And the same with Burning Spear. He's an amazing dancer and he kind of channels the music that he's making. Welcome, come on in. So... That's enough talking from me. I want to just say a little thing about the panel. The great thing about this panel is it was a joint venture. Um, it just so happened that when I was thinking about who I could invite into this uh, festival to do some of the chairing, because I couldn't chair 12 panels as much as I would have liked to, um, my friend Emma came to mind immediately because I've seen her chair many, many uh, panels um, and, and events brilliantly. Um, and also she's written two incredibly good books one about the Total Refreshment Centre called Make, Make Some Space, and the other about Steam Down, the jazz, um, the jazz sort of improvisation collective. And it just so happened that at that very minute when I was thinking about Emma, when, when I spoke to her, it turns out she was just finishing her latest book, which is all about dance. So, what a great coincidence. And between us, we put together a panel uh, of people that we thought would really bring something to the table. So... H. Patton, who's sitting here, is someone that I had the privilege of interviewing before. I won't do the full introduction, I'll leave that to Emma. And I'm still waiting for the other person I invited who's been stuck on a bus somewhere close by. So he will come in and immediately have to go and sit down there. So be kind to him, Justin McKenzie, who runs Jazz Refresh. 
Um, the other two I've not had the chance to meet, in fact I've just met them now and I'm so happy to have been able to meet them. It's one of the great things about doing these kind of events is meeting the people who are involved and that's really why I do it. Um, so without further ado, oh, I should just say just roughly in terms of how we're going to do this, the panel will talk for about 40, 45 minutes. Um, we'll open it up and get you involved and I hope you want to talk and ask questions and also give us your own experiences of dance. We've got a few snacks and fruit juice and fruit, and we're going to bring that out at about quarter to nine. Bring it out here and encourage you to come down, have some snacks, have some fruit, uh, and talk to the panellists, and we can have a little chat. And then <coughs> after that, we're going to a pub called the Marcus of Cornwallis, which is just opposite, um, what's it called, that thing? Brunswick, the Brunswick Centre. Do you guys know where that is? If you don't, ask one of us, and we'll tell you. It's five minutes walk just over there. We've got the upstairs room. We'll play some music from our collaborative playlist, some of which some of you have already contributed to that, but we want to hear from all of you. So when my colleague, well, Maria, there she is at the back, put your hand up, Maria. See Maria there? Find her and tell her what your favourite dance tune is, and we'll add it to our collaborative playlist that we'll be playing in the pub, and we'll be there from 9 to 12, or however long we want to stay around there, okay? There'll be drinks, obviously. Um, the pub does serve food if you want to uh, get a meal there, if, you, if the fruit and the fruit juice is not enough for you. So without any further ado, I will introduce my wonderful chair, Emma Warren. Thank you, Casper. Um, I second what Casper said about... Uh... Hey. Hi, Justin. Perfect hey. timing. Hey. Take a seat. Perfect Take a seat. We're just, we're just starting. Justin McKenzie, ladies and gentlemen. Fresh off the bus. We're just doing the intros now, Justin. Sure. Welcome. It's a perfect, perfect arrival moment. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, so the second what Casper said about thank you for making it um, through the strikes and thank you to the strikers for doing the necessary things. Um, while you're here, feel free to move about if you need to move about. Um, when it comes to the Q&A part, feel free to chip in. You know you're here. We would love to hear from you. Um, could be a question, could be an observation, could be something you want to share. And also if you feel to kind of add something while we're chatting, again, please feel free. Um, we're here with certain pieces of expertise, sometimes huge amounts of expertise, but also you know what you know, and uh, it's useful to have that. Uh, so like Casper said, we'll chat for a bit, and then we'll uh, get some input from you lot. Uh, so we have on the panel the choreographer and author of these two books, which are very recently out on Routledge. Uh, choreographer, author, and academic, Dr. H. Patton. Um, we have also the author of A Quick Ting on Afrobeats, Da, da, da. <laughs> and a radio host on a couple of radio stations, Christian Adolfo. Uh, we have DJ Mantra, co-founder of the Drum and Bass Night Rupture, 16th birthday party happening <coughs> two weekends time at Corsica Studios, unmissable. Um, also co-founder of Equalities Network, EQ50, uh, doing some very, very interesting work around, well, we'll talk about all of that. Uh, and Justin? Yep. from Jazz Refreshed, um, who kind of across Jazz Refreshed works encompass a record label and regular nights and someone who made that transition from a kind of a dance floor um, hosted by DJs to creating dance floors where people are moving to live music. So please, can we just say a big round of applause and welcome to So I thought a, a really good way of getting to understand a bit about who we have in the room is to ask all of them about their relationship to moving to music, their relationship to dance. And I would say, while we're talking about this subject, in this room we should try and decouple dance from being good at dancing. We're talking about moving to music, we're not talking about dance with big connotations of skill or quality, although obviously some of our panellists do have that in their practice, um, you know, high levels of expertise. Um, so, Christian, can we start with you? What can you tell us about your relationship to dancing? Um, so, even everyone, it would have been, I guess, hall parties mm -hmm. growing up for sure. Like growing up in North East London, particularly um, in Tottenham, which is a um, um, Ghanaian by heritage, and there's a massive Ghanaian kind of community there. And it would have been the Borderwell Farm estate um, in some of the flats there, or the iconic um, community centre itself. So it would be with obviously family members and I think inherently people, you know, you, you put music on from your motherland and heritage and you assume that you can just like move to it. But unfortunately I wasn't as, as gifted as some of my peers. So when it came to like those kind of competitions, 
and then the aunties and uncles kind of like pushing and forced me to the middle. I was always just like trying to cling on to the, <laughs> the wall, like praying to like submerge myself into the wallpaper. So I'd be kind of <laughs> um, But then I kind of, you know, it kind of grew, it grew in me more and more going to those kind of events. And it was less about, as you said, being polished with finished article at, at that young age, but just seeing the feeling of <coughs> people connecting to music of the mother tongue but not understand the language, but moving through rhythm, which I always found was like incredible for people so young to have that connection to a place they've never been to and then grow up and have that kind of full circle journey. So that would have been my kind of first experience mm -hmm. with, with dance, yeah. So moving from like the position of like a hesitant dancer mm -hmm. in a kind of very dance literate environment to kind of finding your own way through it. Yeah, definitely. Thank you. Indy, what about you? So, I guess my relationship to dancing is very much through like the rave mm -hmm. in that kind of context. I did actually, when you were talking about um, dancing to like your mother tongue and thinking that what, an early memory I do have is being about six or seven and uh, my dad's from the Punjab and being in one of my auntie's living rooms and then doing this snake dance, all the women, only the women could go there and there was no music, it was all through stamping, clapping, singing, mm -hmm. wailing and just it was like a frenzy, do you know what I mean? And it was just wild and just like ducking and diving through all these sort of alchemies and chunis everywhere and getting wrapped up in it. And I love that feeling of just the hecticness of it um, because within that I can find a stillness. And I think when I go raving now, the music's so loud and it's... But actually in that kind of context, I can get quite... My mind can get quite still. And in those spaces is when you kind of feel yourself. You know, I don't like people talking to me too much. I like, I like to be by myself in a corner. <laughs> That's my kind of spot. Um, I'm not a skilled dancer, but I feel it and my body moves to it. Um, and for me, especially with the kind of hecticness of life and motherhood and all that kind of stuff, it can be a very healing experience. Mm, I really feel what you're saying about stillness and I know that I've experienced that, maybe some of you have as well, the kind of the way that moving to music can just allow, someone described it to me as your brain dropping into your body. Yeah. Um, and yeah, it's a, thank you for that, that's a really nice. I've tried to meditate and I'm still trying, <laughs> I'm not gonna give up. Um, I find it very, very, very hard. Mm. But if I'm moving, that moving meditation, I can sometimes get it in yoga and I can get it um, on the dance floor, definitely. Mm. Yes, a dance floor meditation. Mm -hmm. Justin, what about you? What's your relationship to moving to music? What can you tell us? Well, I'm a child of the 80s, so I guess I'm a hip-hop child. Um, so when I was in primary school, and this kind of informed the rest of my life, actually, musically, but um, I grew up in a church, but hip-hop was just coming through electro and mm -hmm. these things. So, like, from the States, although it was already from the 70s, but in the early 80s, um, b-boy, or breaking, as we call it, um, came over, so we had like a lino mat in the bike sheds. Don't they have bike sheds these days, but you know, the bike sheds, there'd be a breaking <laughs> mat, and someone would be beatboxing. And we were just the culture just engulfed us, you know. Um, everything from America that you saw on television was to do with you know hip hop or actually just breaking, really, mainly um, electro and that kind of music. So that love of b boy, I'm not a good b boy by the way, or break up, but um, I've always loved that culture. and that has kind of, and the whole musically everything, and that kind of informed my direction to where I'm today, um, I would say. But I'm also a uh, youth of the, um, my kind of youth and into my 20s in the, the 90s. And anybody who, you know, of any age of going out in the 90s knows that the 90s were the peak, I think, of rave and like party culture and club culture before the mice of like clubs getting decimated and you know, it was like house parties, there were loads of clubs to go to, the West End wasn't as restricted to, to be like, um, you know, parking and stuff like that. Um, there were clubs all around London, you could go to pretty much anything. Um, I was really a lot on the kind of street sound scene, so like a lot of rear groove, a lot of that kind of stuff, but also involved in hip hop. Um, eventually, by the age of 18, becoming a DJ, and that's where my path to today came from. But it was collecting records from that whole hip-hop culture of breaks and samples and learning where they came from. Also learning instruments. I learned instruments when I was young. So 
having a connection to actually mm. playing stuff um, as well. But yeah, dance has always been a part. I mean, I was part of the soccer scene. Um, my family's from Trinidad and Grenada, so that was from family and then going out and being really involved. Um, and raga became a big thing in the late 80s, um, which kind of, you know, and when I was in school, we got involved in that. And there was always a dance to go with things. There was all, you know, even in hip hop, you know, you'd go out and you want to be able to jump off your foot or do a particular thing. So there was always that. And I think it wasn't until going out clubbing in my like late teens where that sense of just dancing without a kind of routine or dancing without, a, you know, just dancing for the sake of it kind of came from. So, yeah, um, and it's, it's always been connected. And as I'm sure we'll come to later, even as I moved, we moved, I say we moved away, but we broadened to go to live music, but live music that wasn't necessarily known for having dancing in it, we still carried that sensibility forward. Mm. I think that's what's so interesting about what you've done because it's definitely rooted in a dance floor culture. Um, just before we move on, yeah. um, can you tell us about a dance move that you kind of managed to master that you were like very pleased about? As long as I don't have to do it. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 just tell us. You can just tell um, us in the words. I've managed in my life. I say, like, master, I don't know. Okay, no, master, don't. Um, something that you just got you in your arsenal. Okay, I'm going to say <laughs> quick three things. One <laughs> is I managed to do the windmill mm -hmm. um, when I was really young. I can't do it now, um, which was a really big thing. I mean, when you were into b-boy and a break-in, mm -hmm. people could spin on their backs, people could even spin on their heads, but to do the windmill, um, yeah. But it didn't, you know, it didn't last long because I didn't, as that kind of went out, and I tried to get back to it later, I couldn't do it again, <laughs> but, um, and now it's too late. But the other thing was whining, um, in, and particularly soca, you know, um, I'm, you know, I'm not <laughs> mad skilled, but I can dance like that. And also, and this is, you know, a lot of people probably won't know this, uh, people in the panel might, but there's a crubbing, which is like kind of a slow jam dancing, mm -hmm. um, <laughs> which, it's kind of out of fashion now, I would imagine. You, know, you don't really see it. People, people they don't really go down to these slow. But there was something in uh, culture, particularly coming from like Lovers Rock, where you dance. So, and that was really big when we were going out, you know, mm. dancing with people, but in that slow jam style. Mm. That was... Thank you. I'm very glad I asked you that because <laughs> I recall seeing you on a, um, a Men Menelik Shabazz's documentary about Lovers Rock. Yeah. So. And in it, you're describing exactly that, aren't you? Yeah. The, the rubber dub. Mm -hmm. And you're describing uh, in, a, in, in detail exactly what's happening, kind of like mechanically, dance wise, right, when right, people yeah. are dancing like that. Yes, yes. Um, so I do want to know about your relationship with dancing, but <laughs> seeing as you've arrived here, would you mind giving us a little bit more detail about what Justin is talking about? Okay. Well, number one, I would say I would disagree with him about it. Go, having gone out, it's still very much oh, alive. Yeah. <laughs> it depends on what age group you're, okay. you're in and that's what, um, I mean. that's what, I mean. what, really what scene young. you're moving in. But <laughs> if you go anywhere where, where um, you hear the real roots reggae and you're hearing lovers rock and etc., you will still see them doing that dance. So that is a way of what we call coupling. That's man and woman coming together, dancing together in an intimate way. It started um, in, in back in the day, when, when we're going back now to around the 18th century and so forth, when they were dancing the mentor, they would do the mentor dance, you know, and the mentor dance, they do a kind of side together side and side together side. And as they're moving, they would move closer together. Now, after a while now, when the, when the spaces got packed, then people couldn't move laterally anymore. There wasn't enough space. So they did what we call rent a tile. You stand up on the <laughs> one spot the whole night and you dance and you use the body um, I love to demonstrate that. <laughs> you use the body where, standing on the one spot, you could either move, move round and your body will, your pelvis makes a figure of eight. So the man and the woman making the figure of eight, holding each other, and so you don't move off that tile the whole night. So that's why it's called rent a tile. <laughs> or you could be moving, circling in semicircles, moving one to the next. Or you can go round the world where the two pelvises lock together 
and then making a circular action. So you see all of this, this is what they call the rub. Some people call it scrub. Some people call it the dub. But all of this is about dancing intimately. And this, this has stood the test of time. It still goes on now. It even went through the um, time where, you know, the hairstyle curly perm where man and woman used to have the curly perm which uses a lot of activator, a lot of chemical in the hair to make the hair curly. And so sometimes when you're dancing with the partner, you'd find that you have to close the eye. <laughs> and sometimes by the time you finish dancing, the eye would be a bit sticky <laughs> to open because, because of the products. But that's, that's really what the dance was about, okay? And it was a way of being able to communicate with each other. And at a point, this is where um, part of what you talked about, about the stillness mm -hmm. coming inside, because at a point, the two heartbeats would be synchronized and the two of you will be in a room full of people, but it's only the two of you that exist for that moment in time. And sometimes it gets to the point where the two become one and you're not even conscious of anything else but being involved in that moment. And it was, it was about um, the enjoyment of dance. It wasn't a sexual thing. Because people would come and they would, they would dance the whole night and then say thank you and go their separate ways at the end of the, the night as well. But of course, there would be some who, oh, can I get your number? <laughs> um, yeah. But also, in dance, we can sometimes understand the difference between sensuality and sexuality, isn't it? That yes. this is highly sensual, that's it's not right. necessarily sexual. Yes. Um, and that's an important thing because that runs through dance completely. Um, okay, if I talk about myself and my yes, relationship please. to dance, then um, I, I was always one of those children that my parents would say, um, in the Jamaican way, we say your head's up, means that you're a little bright and, you know, a bit mannish. Because I would, we would um, go to parties, which were family parties, like you mentioned. And that would be either for a birthday, birth night party, we'd call it, or it would be for christening or for a wedding. Now, when, when you go to a wedding, you know, the bride always looks beautiful on the day and all the men them line up to dance with the, with the bride. Children would be running around and playing, except for one child who line up with the rest of the men them as well. <laughs> I used to line up because I don't feel like I go to the wedding if I don't dance with the bride as well. And sometimes I, my head would be at her navel, but I would be dancing with the bride as well. Okay, so that's where my involvement with dance really started. And so people used to call me. And um, much like you, they would call me and say, come, come and dance and thing. But unlike him, where he wanted to recede in the world, I would step out and I would show them the latest dances and things. And then as I grew up, and um, my cousins would be back and forth from Jamaica. Whenever they, they go and come, I would want to know what's the latest dance, what's the movement they're doing. Because in Jamaica, the dances, um, they progress and we name a lot of them. So as soon as a new dance come out, everybody have to name that dance. Whether it's the Chucky, where they used to use the shoulder, Changa, 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 Changa. Changa, or you know, later on we took some of the American influences as well, like the bump, where you said sort of jump and you bump, bump the hips and bump the buttocks, etc., against each other. All of these things we used to do within the, dan the dance hall space. And so, when I'm talking about dance hall space now, I mean the location where it's done, and so, and um, Within the dancing now, within our community, there were two sets of dancers, basically, which kind of will lead into his, his route and my route. Because you had those who they called soul head, that listened to soul music, rare groove, etc. You used to go take extra shirts to, to the clubs, sweat up and change, go and change and sweat again and dance vigorously the whole night. And then you used to have 
the roots man them those are the ones that follow reggae music and they will go to the, the dances and they will dance all night and move in a way that they look cool now i used to straddle the two so like on a friday night i go to the soul club and i sweat up a dance and and used to have, um, uh, there was a family of, um, of girls, um, five of them, who we used to go to, um, <coughs> I and my friends, we used to go out and one of, one of the, the um, sisters was always my partner, we'd be invited to all the dances so that we could lead the dance, when they want to get everything do, going, we would dance, and that was soul music, rare groove, etc., but then from Friday and um, from Saturday night now, it would be the reggae club and I would be in the reggae club Friday and Saturday, Saturday night dancing to the roots, etc. And then at that time, change of clothing as well because you would put on your Gabici jumper, which was a special Italian made jumpers and um, people wore farer pants unfortunately I, I used to play basketball and things so my legs were always too big to fit into the farer so I had specially tailor-made pants and things and so dance was part of the cultural identity it was a way of going home within this space and also it was a way of learning from the elders because as a child Children were to be seen and not heard. So when adults were there, we had the dining room where the children should be playing games and things. And then you find the kitchen where uh, the cooking is going on. My sisters and cousins and things will be in there. And then you have the living room where the adults were, where big people talk. So they would be talking, you know, about home, things that, that used to happen home and things. And they would be dancing. Yeah. And because I was the eldest boy, I was allowed to be in there to play the music and to serve the drinks. So I kind of trained up as a, as a DJ from then. But then later on, um, I ended up marrying my wife. She's a DJ um, in one of the longest running female songs called Nzinga Songs. So um, she now took over the music playing side and I, I leave that, that to her. But music dance has always been part and parcel of our family and it goes through the children, all of my children, they will dance something. Sometimes you'll hear them put on a Mahalia Jackson and they start to dance and people will say, when you know about that? But it's because they've come through the music. And the, the, when, when the whole rap came in, I was always interested in it. But because of the roots, I didn't go down that route. I watched it from a distance. Mm. <coughs> Sorry. Yeah, there's some water. Yeah. Um, I can also recommend Nzinga Sound sometimes do some shows on NTS uh, and play out quite frequently. So, um, yeah, easy, easy enough to get to know if you don't already. Um, it's interesting what you're saying about this interplay between the dances. Um, in Jamaica and in the diaspora because mm -hmm. Christian, there's, there's a strong element of that, isn't it, in your story or in your telling of the Afrobeat story uh, and I wonder if you can just um, tell us, give us a brief sense about how that plays out in your context and then maybe if you can tell us a bit, given that we're in a university about the role of university um, Afro-Caribbean societies African-Caribbean societies in the transmission of the music that you've written about Yeah, so I think mm -hmm. For me, the dances are like, so I guess you have to look at, I guess, the kind of mid-2000s, late-2000s and how, I guess for a lot of kids who have kind of primarily West African heritage, how, you know, the internet and Afrobeats from the continent was kind of bubbling up mm -hmm. and how the dances were almost instantly that kind of marker or connection to home in some kind of way mm -hmm. and um, in, the book, in the book I make the, the parallel between seeing some African footballers in the, in the Premier League and when they're celebrating and after school and etc mm -hmm. and how they're dancing and how immediately you saw you know, that <coughs> connection between popular artists of, in Nigeria and Ghana through like, 
the music they're playing and the dances they do alongside their songs, alongside their, I guess, kind of comrades or friends who are playing football as well, and how that instantly is like spread to another whole different kind of population who don't know where the players are from, but mm. are intrigued to know like where this dance is and where the culture is within that. And dances with names, right? Yeah, and names as well. So I think, <coughs> um, I mean, there are a whole myriad of different names. I think for me, well, the one that kind of coincided with like it become Afrobeats coming to the mainstream would have been um, the Azonto. Mm. Yeah. And I think at that time, coincided with the World Cup being in South Africa the first time the World Cup was ever in Africa as well. And then kind of Ghana's run to the quarterfinals. And I remember England went out very early in that tournament. And for a lot of people, that was their second kind of underdog team. And everyone started to grow to the the movement around it. And I think dance was a big thing around it with you know, the celebrations. That song um, from Fuse LDG as well, it being shot, him, him himself being of like, British Ghanaian heritage, it being shot, the original one in London, mm -hmm. with two, um, I guess, kind of mime artists, but they had like white masks in their faces, but they were obviously of African heritage, but they were just going around <coughs> dancing, um, just interacting with everyone. And I think for me, that kind of showed universal um, appeal of what dance can do with, I guess, I don't know, essentially having a mask up, but mm -hmm. everyone wanted to like, you know, after their night in the pub, whatever, we're just seeing they would jump in and, and get along. And then seeing how, you know, the kind of black body is transported from the motherland and them being able to do that. And then going back the other way with it blowing up is, I guess, one of those kind of key dances or kind of key moments where a lot of kids who, growing up in school, might have felt ashamed of saying where they were from in Africa or the parents' heritage, finally had that kind of glue to go and dig a bit deeper through music and through dance mm -hmm. um, in itself. Mm. And, and what about the <coughs> university part of it, the role of the university societies? So that was, a bit, I think, personally on my journey it was, I remember going to like the library the first week to pick up my books and stuff. And- Which was where? In, in Kent, in Canterbury. And I remember, mm -hmm. I'd finished and I was leaving and this girl came up to me and was like, really good, you know what I was like, what? So said, do you, want, do you want to join the ACS? And I was like, I don't know what it was, this acronym. And then it's like, I dug a bit deeper into it and I think we were really lucky because the, the girl who was our kind of president, mm -hmm. she had a good blend of the music and the culture as well. So there were like different kind of lectures that were speaking about different kind of topics around the continent and that kind of crossover, mm -hmm. but then also the, the dances within that as well. And a lot of them, you realise, uh, we're looking at transition from maybe 2007, 2008, <coughs> from like UK funky into Afrobeats. So a lot of the MCs or the people who are promoters in that scene were themselves becoming entrepreneurs and putting on these nights across um, different universities which had big, um, African Caribbean populations or like um, students in there. So like Brunel, um, Kingston, um, London South Bank, but then also in the East Midlands we had um, the Montford, mm -hmm. Leicester, um, Nottingham, Nottingham Trent, and those are all like big kind of incubators for people who are probably from London, they couldn't get back as usual to kind of experience nightlife mm -hmm. on the same level, but we able to have this kind of touring party to have these DJs go and play this music, have the latest um, music from the continent. But I think in a way it's almost like positivity around the narrative of it all, because a lot of the music before that where we have a lot of like youth from London that are making it from the UK, always had this label of being really aggressive or negative connotations around it. And it felt like at that moment it was finally like transitioning and realising that this is a really kind of positive space we can all be in. And even if we're dancing in a way that people can't understand, like, it's friendly some and we, people. yeah, some people, <laughs> yeah, we can always come together, mm. yeah. 
it was, it was, that was one of the, you know, your book's brilliant and there were lots of different things in it but, but, <coughs> that relate to what we're talking about because you make that kind of interconnectedness of music and dancing, which is so well understood in certain areas and so poorly understood in other kind of more Eurocentric mm. environments. Yeah. Um, but there's one phrase, before India, I'm going to ask you about the rupture dance floor shortly, but can you just tell us a bit about the phrase gone missing? So, yeah, there were... I was lucky to interview two kind of early prominent dancers who feature a lot in the early kind of Yucafra Beats um, videos called The Home Bros. They're based in East London. And when I interviewed them, they, they talk about this idea of like, going missing. And it's almost aligns with, I guess, what you talk about, stillness that like some of us have mentioned here, where there'll come a point in the night where it's kind of like twilight, maybe hours, and there, there aren't maybe so many people or in the in the space where it being even, but it's almost as if like the the ancestors start to like pull your strings a bit more and you start to move in a way in which even you shock yourself with regards to like how do I even be able to move my body in such a way. So I think that's what they they come across and when they when they say it as well. And it's amazing because they have these um classes every week where a lot of the Afrobeats that I they want to kind of break a tune, they'll go there first and play, play it to them first and see how people react to them without it being released first and then kind of go back and tweak a bit more. So I think that idea of kind of going missing is almost like, in another way, like finding yourself mm. as well, because some of us are so unseen on the day to day, but when we go in that space and kind of go MIA, we come out of there kind of, reconnect and feel ourselves as well. Mm. Yeah. What would you add to this? Well, it's a couple of things really, because one, when when you speak about the um, Society for Car Caribbean Studies or the, the Afro-Caribbean um, societies, as they used to be called, um, <clears throat> that is something that's a, that's a continuity that has continued. Because I remember back in the day, those were the ways in which we used to connect with a lot of young people who were in the university setting. I used to be part of a company called Ajido Pan African Dance Ensemble, which was the biggest African dance company in Europe, actually. And um, it, it used to be based in London here, but we used to tour the whole country and we used to go to um, the different um, the, the different union and perform, perform there and then they would have dances and things that connected so it, it, that, this sounds like a continuity of that in terms of being able to allow young people to connect and so therefore even in terms of the training when, when we trained I trained in Ghana with the National Dance Company there and then later on we used to tour with um with Fella, Fella Kuti, and we used to open the show for him at Glastonbury and all these other places. So there was always that connection between the traditional dance practice and the the contemporary, the popular. The and so um popular culture was always connected to the um the traditional culture. But the, but the other thing as well was that um, in terms of the, the, the young people, I saw the development of, of um, the Afrobeat and the high life had been there before that. And then you had um, hip life in, in um, Ghana and over in West Africa. So, and then you had Kwaito that was developing in South Africa and it was called Digong in um, Zimbabwe and, and those areas. And so it was an amalgamation of all of this coming together. But I would say that I think um, dance hall was quite key to that development as well, because out of, you know, um, when we speak about the music, you had the de development of ska in Jamaica during the time of independence and when Jamaicans were first coming here, you had the ska. Then from the ska went to the rock steady, from the rock steady into the, the um, dub and the reggae. And then from reggae now, you had the development of dancehall. 
But then the influence of reggae cre out of that and the influence, as I said before, you had the soul heads. You had the coming together of the two, mixing in the music, and that was the development of Lovers Rock. Mm -hmm. People like, I know um, some of you might know um, Janet Kay when she sang Silly Games, and that's where all the men have to hold their ears because all the women <laughs> go for note. that high note, <laughs> yes. And so um, you had the whole of that development, and then from out of that now, you had the development of the, the jungle and garage, drum and bass, etc. coming. And all of that kind of laid the ground to open the way for Afrobeat. And I remember um, a, lot of, a lot of African um, students and, and African people, the young people, they used to hide behind, behind them the reggae as well, and a lot of them, if they ask where they come from, they say Jamaica. And so you'd have somebody with thick Nigerian accent saying he's a Jamaican, and we would know that, no, he's not a Jamaican. But we knew that it was an identity thing. And so I think it was the whole Afrobeat movement is what then enabled the young, the young Africans um, from the continent to be able to and break out and announce themselves and their presence here and then be able to sit we sat down together side by side now rather than one hiding or masking the other and so that's where the kind of mutual respect and then the collaboration start to go on because you have so many artists such as Shaka Wale and Burna Boy all, all going to Jamaica to collaborate with the Jamaican artists and then they're coming back and then now you have some of the soca artists then like Masha Mantano who has been collaborating and working with all of this and so the big pot stirs but what, what happens is that the movement is a key thing where the movements are starting to blur where you now start to see movements that were specifically dancehall movement before, they're now coming into soca, they're now in Afrobeat, and then Afrobeat movement coming into dancehall. And then you see, like, like it's funny, I smile when you talk about what are the things you're, you're pleased you're good at is whining. <laughs> because within the Jamaican context, men don't whine on their own. Women whine, but men can only whine when they're dancing with a partner, but not on their own because it's seen as a feminized movement. But within, within um, the eastern side of the Caribbean, mm -hmm. whining is something that's done by both men and women. Do we need a clarification of the wine? Does the room need a clarification of the wine? Okay. <laughs> Would you clarify the wine? Yes, please. Right. He mentioned it, sir. All right, but with the whining, what happens? If, I, if I'm going to give a mechanical explanation, it, it's um, the, the torso circling around, but it's rocking back and forth at the same time. So you get this tumbling action. So it's circling and it's whining at the moment at the same time. So I call it tumbling as well. It's like it's tumbling. If you look at the clothes in the washing machine, when they start to tumble, <laughs> okay? So when you're dancing that way, you can dance on your own or you can dance with your partner and whine, whine in the space. So that, that's why, um, because the focus is on the pelvis within Jamaica, we, we kind of, try to control it where um, the, they don't want the focus on the male pelvis, they want the focus on the female pelvis. So that's why, as a man, you can be the best dancer and no linger and all these dances and things, but the camera will move from you as soon as a woman starts to whine. And once she can whine good, the, definitely the focus will move from you to her. Whereas in, in other parts of the Caribbean, man and woman can whine independently or together. Mm. There are so many layers, aren't there? Yeah. I mean, even just in this one tiny aspect of, of the dance that we're talking about, the layers 
who's allowed to move which parts of their body. Yes. I'm reminded of, uh, in a different context, uh, Barbara Ehrenreich, who wrote Dancing in the Streets, pointing out that, mm-hmm. you know, in certain contexts, legs were considered so unbelievably shocking and sexual that even, like, the legs of furniture were covered in houses, <laughs> let alone moving them or showing them. You know, parts of body, parts of the body move in and out of acceptability, don't they? That's right. Across time and across space. Mm-hmm. Um, and one of the things that y- you were all talking about is we've got this image of like the kind of the guy at the back who's like not moving very much, but he's got the movement that he can have or that he allows himself to have. And then you've got the guy who's in the middle of the dance who's moving more. And this kind of makes me think about a drum and bass dance floor. You know, in my head, if I think about, you know, I was like going to some of those nights back in the day, um, particularly in the north. I was living in Manchester at the time and uh, this one particular, like very, very intense kind of jungle drum and bass night. Um, and I can see some men who are like not moving very much, who are wearing quite a lot of clothing. <laughs> it's very hot, but you know, the puffer jacket is not coming off. <laughs> but they're not moving very much, but they're moving some, and this is the movement that they will allow themselves. And then you've got people who are really moving a lot, like amazing dancers, like stepping, people moving low, up and down in space, around. Um, and I wonder if you can give us a sense of the rupture dance floor. Mm-hmm. Um, what, you know, I know you've been going for a long time, so it might be hard to, to like just capture it because it probably was different 16 years ago than it is now. If you can I mean, paint us a picture, what, what would we see? We've been going for 16 years now, and it does vary. I mean, people come to us quite a lot because for drum and bass, it's seen as one of the most diverse dance floors, like mm-hmm. club nights for that. We still have a long, long, long way to go, in my opinion. Um, but it's definitely getting better. Um, you know, the, I, for me, the best dance floors is just people who can express themselves in any which way that's true to them, mm. whatever that may be. Um, and also when you have people from all walks of life, different genders, sexualities, or different incomes, like all of that coming together for the music, that makes a really interesting and powerful experience, I think. It, it, Bring something to the energy of a dance floor. Um, but I think as I'm quite conscious that with, with Rupture and with the DJs yeah. that the music has generally got shorter, like tunes are getting shorter, the length of tunes mm-hmm. are getting shorter. Um, you know, back in the day, the, st- the kind of standard length would kind of be seven minutes. And now you're looking at a lot of tunes are kind of three minutes and under. Mm-hmm. And that impacts the way a DJ DJs Mm. Um, it can become very the next bigger 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 faster 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 energy 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 the whole time when you just have one hour to play it's kind of this hype thing of who can kind of kill it the hardest Mm. and when it's all about that it doesn't allow the dance floor to kind of breathe and settle into it and allow for people to properly dance it's all Slapping the walls and arms up and I love that. Don't get me wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Who doesn't? You know, and kind of like, you know, shouting for reloads and stuff. But I do think that there is something that you miss then in the kind of journey. Mm. Um, and I think when DJs are allowed to have longer sets and journey and realize that it's not all about kind of, you know, faster, faster. The, the about kind of creating the most amount of intense energy possible Mm -hmm. it allows the dance floor to actually dance you know and I think this is where the kind of crowd comes into play so much because as a DJ you know I might drop something that's a little bit deeper and all it takes is me seeing one one or two people just feeling it whether that's their eyes closed for one minute or whatever because if you're playing something deeper people aren't going to be erupting Mm -hmm. you know and that can Sometimes that's what people are chasing yeah. as a DJ and you can feel quite, you have to be quite brave to be like, no, I'm, I'm not going to go there yet. I'm going to, we're going to wait, you know, and see how this kind of goes. And all it takes is you seeing one or two dancers appreciating that. It's like, oh, let's go even deeper. Let's see. Do you know what I mean? And then kind of building it up in different ways. So it's very much a kind of call and response, the DJ to the crowd. But I think in terms of rupture, it, it is an intense dance floor. I'm not going to lie. It's busy. It's packed, it's really loud, that the systems we use, obviously there's a lot, a lot of bass, there's, you have to really find your spot if you mm-hmm. want to kind of have a bit of space. Um, but it's respectful. Um, for me, of course, there's so much talk about creating a safe space on the dance floor, um, particularly for women, 
Um, and we're, we're, we're quite lucky in a sense. I think me and my partner, like it's something that's been such an important part um, of us in, mm. and, and in creating good dance floors that it kind of trickles down, you know, like not that we're above, not, I don't mean it like a trickle down thing, but the message gets... Well, the intention is clear. The intention is clear, yeah, exactly. We've never had to do kind of big statements and, and stuff like that, which I appreciate people, you know, should do, I think, if, if they feel like it's going to create a, a safer dance floor. But we're lucky in the sense that we've never had to do that. But I do also think that there is a real, a, a real power in unsafe dance floors, not in terms of being touched by people, anything like that, that's disgusting. But I grew up going to squat raves mm. and illegal dance floors, and they're amazing <laughs> because you've, it, there, there, there's an element of danger. And that is actually a really thrilling experience as a raver because, you know, you might have been travelling for three hours to get there and then it's busted and then you've got to go to the next place and it might not be till four or five in the morning until they've actually set up the rigs and it's on. But that mission and that commitment to it, then when it does, when the music does start, it creates this very, very intense atmosphere. Um, so, you know, and, and even in unsafe buildings, there's, there's something to it that, you know, I'm not condoning people getting hurt, but it's, there is something thrilling being in this kind of abandoned cinema and this abandoned bingo hall that is, you know, it, it's, it's really exciting. And I think it creates a very, very special and unique energy. And unfortunately, it's way harder to do now, like really hard. <laughs> I mean, I think there's something very interesting in there about, um, you know, obviously for a younger generation that suffers like generational massive anxiety and huge amounts of stress, the idea of unsafe Space it seems really counterintuitive, especially when safe spaces has come to mean some very specific things about kind of you know respect for others. But I'm with you, and I've I've um, have found myself having some interesting conversations on this subject recently about the power of going through the fire, yeah. and and what that can do for you. And in fact, Damon Frost, who was one of the um, U.S. hip hop dancers who took kind of breaking to Europe first in the early mid '80s. Um, spoke about this as well, about the, the idea of kind of the dance floor as an initiation, yeah. uh, something that you can go through in order to sharpen up your tools, and you can't necessarily get that in an environment where everything is, is too kind of um, safe. I mean, we don't really have quite the right language for it, yeah. it's an interesting area. Does anyone else have anything they'd like to add to that? Well, I speak about that. Um, well, this Sorry. book, um, the, the... Citations, man. The, what you call it? <laughs> dance Hall in Slash Securities. Um, it's an edited collection where we all, everybody within it, we speak about dance hall as an in slash secure space because what secures some people makes others insecure. So, for example, um, you know, like what you've been speaking there, it reminds me, it has resonances with back in the day when we used to have blues parties mm -hmm. where blues parties were held in base, basements of derelict spaces or it w used to be held in um, in factories where you could when you could find a factory that you could get get um, hooked up to in terms of having power etc and within those dances it was a case of being within a space where it felt safe because it was a darkened space with many bodies around. So you could almost feel the heartbeat of the others around you. And so that created a sense of what um, Victor Turner calls um, communitas, an intense feeling of camaraderie. And that happens particularly when everybody dance into the same rhythm. Mm -hmm. So you, you might hear the music, a uh, boo doo 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 boo doo doo do 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 and you see all the shoulders rising and falling at the same time you might feel sometimes you get you get double double and triple dances because you you might be dancing with a partner in front of you but the place is so full that there's somebody pressing <laughs> uh, pressing behind you so you're feeling their bottom is dancing with yours and you're kind of controlling their dance and they're controlling your dance and the people either side are controlling. And so there's this intense feeling of security amongst you, but there's also the insecurity that it could be 
raided at any time and police come and shut it down. So there's that. But also the insecurities there in even in terms of the way way they dress. Because you have some women that may wear what we call bare as you dare. So they wear um bra tops or they wear um clo um batty riders which are shorts that are very, very short at, at the back you can see the bottom of the 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 the, the cheek so to speak but it's a case of look but don't touch this was their space where they can present themselves and negotiate their identity to suit themselves but it was also a space in which people could admire and people became as we call it in Jamaica, is a space where you get somadification or somaditization. You become somebody of worth. You become visible within a society where you are made invisible. So during the moments that you're, you're within the dance space, you become visible. Because if you're a good dancer, everybody will be looking at you. And when I say a good dancer, it doesn't mean that you're necessarily a professional dancer just that if you can dance well people will admire and give you that space and so it's within all of this that various levels start to to take place like when you you spoke about what was the word again the phrase gone that's missing. gone missing yes in in um, within the dance hall space people talk about getting lost they get lost in the dance. They get lost um, in the dance. They, they, they go to another level where when they dance, they're dancing, it might be, be somebody you know very well and you call to them and they don't even see you because they're somewhere and you have to touch them and say, oh, oh, sorry. And then they'll see that you are actually speaking to them or you, you're acknowledging them because people travel and so um you know even when you when you feel can, can i take a second just to try it mm. with them if, if we can can we all just stand a minute a, a quick minute all right we're going to you stand up as well come on <laughs> <laughs> so just start we do one foot in front of the other we're going to just push forward back forward back forward and just put the hand in the air and you circle, and circle, Bogo. and circle, yes, bogle, uh -huh. you see, when we do the bogle, everybody do the bogle, when you have the darkened room and the music is pumping, and everybody doing the bogle together, there's a sense of camaraderie that comes into the space, we're all together, all one, and the bogle, it, it, it um, changes, because in Jamaica, it's forward, but in the UK, it then became yeah. backwards. <laughs> backwards. So let's try that one. Just go back and back and back. And the arms forward and forward and forward. Okay? And that's the ball go. Yeah. Thank you very much. <laughs> so, you see, at first when I ask you to get up, I say everybody looking around and content. But once you actually started doing it, People then got into it and you forget about the fact that whether you're doing it well or not. And even in the song itself, um, when Buju Banton sing, he said, I must say nanny, that, but that's not how Bogle's done. She's not doing it good, but she's rocking the same way. You know, meaning that she's not, she's not the best of dancers, but she still can dance and join in because it's all inclusive. Mm. Everybody has the possibility. And that's what happens within most of our social spaces, whether it's, it's a family space, everybody has the opportunity to dance and be part of it. And even if you're not so good, they're still going to big you up and, and say, you know, like sometimes they say, go Christian, go Christian, go Christian, go Christian. And Christian can do his thing and he can withdraw as he's ready, you know what I mean. Everybody takes it um, how they, they, they feel it at that point. And this is where, you know, we have to be really grateful to the people who create spaces for us to dance in because 
you know, we can't really talk about dancing without talking about space, because otherwise, where are we going to do it together? You know, both of you put on, create spaces for people to dance in. Mm-hmm. And maybe a final thing we can talk about before we kind of, you know, hear what you that I hear have to say, <laughs> if you want to, and please want to, um, <laughs> It's just about, I'm, I'm interested in the idea of like repetition and regularity. Mm. You know, you did Jazz Refreshed every week yeah. for a long time in West, more recently, regularly in East London, in Brick Lane, right? Yeah. Um, so what does it do to the dance floor to, to have that space every week? We're not talking about the dance room, obviously, I'm, yeah. I'm talking about the, the people who comprise it. How important <laughs> is that? It's, it's a strange one because it's a strange world. Um, so for those who don't know, um, we, Jazz Refresh is jazz music. But it's not, it started, a lot of people think we came from the jazz world when we started, we didn't. We came from playing hip hop, playing soul, playing soca, broken beat. Broken beat, for those who might know the genre and look into it, it had a massive influence over us because we were there one of our crew was one of the kind of architects of it, that's IQ from Bugs in the Attic. So he's one of our crew. And when we were putting on nights, this night called Co-op in um, Curtin Road, Plastic People, mm-hmm. was going on. And this kind of touched what you were saying, actually, about um, DJ, the relationship between DJs and the dance floor, because I think that's the, where it starts. Um, where we see in a lot of music, um, the parallel of how things when a music kind of is starting out or it's becoming it's experimental mm. it's allowed space because people don't know the music not familiar with the music so somewhere like co-op where <clears throat> it was a night made by producers who were djing the music so they might come with a new tune on that night they just finished mix it and it's you know you may never hear it again mm. Mm. so there wasn't this thing of anthems you know there wasn't like i want to hear that big tune it was what's coming tonight and those tunes mm. had a long build like you know they might, mm. some of them might be like nine minutes long, where it starts off and eventually you get into the music maybe three minutes into the tune, but the beat mm. was there. So people were just dancing and it was really quite pure in that sense. And from where we were coming from, um, when Broken Beat was, became a thing in the early 2000s, like 2000, <coughs> 2000 basically, 1999, 2000, it was quite refreshing because we were playing a lot of other music where there were anthems and it was <clears throat> we were trying to battle against that thing of just going for the chair you know playing the big tunes where you hear everywhere it was we were trying to be a bit more left field and play but we also were collectors of jazz and um we were getting a bit fatigued we were playing a lot of parties so we wanted to do something that was not actually for dancing <laughs> funnily enough uh, it was not for dancing it was for a lounge play our music and just let because you know, jazz at that time, I know there was a jazz dance um, and there were jazz dancers that still continued from the mm-hmm. 80s and stuff, but it was very separate to what we were doing. And um, we just wanted something to play. But when we started to play in Man Bar in West London, this is like 2003, um, a lot of the stuff is to be danced to, but it was still a lounge until we put live music on, which is a few weeks into it, um, and then kept it live. But the jazz, we went to jazz things as well. But around that time, if you go jazz now, it's not like it was then. Like, mm-hmm. you know, you mm-hmm. didn't have, you had the talent of musicians, but you didn't have the scene and you didn't have the kind of energy within the scene. And a lot of the early people that we put on our stage at um, Mau Mau were actually musicians who were from the broken beat scene. So people like Kylie Tatham, Mark DeCliveau, who were, had jazz chops and when they played, but people were, you know, it was a dance thing. Now, once we'd kind of gone through that, um, then you went to playing one head, one week might be straight ahead, the next week might be some like Afro-Cuban thing. So not every week was for dancing, but the whole atmosphere of what going to jazz was at the time, which was kind of sit down, you clap at the solos and you know, you make a little bit of noise, but you don't, it wasn't rowdy, we didn't come from that. So our whole ethos when we put on a jazz live night was you stand up, you know, and you make noise for the bands. Mm-hmm. And if they're playing something to dance to, you dance to it. And it was always important for us to have DJing before and DJing after. And not just DJing jazz either, which is kind of ironic, because that's why we started the night, you know, <laughs> and we had live jazz on. But it was about showing connections between jazz and other music. Hip hop, broken beat, you know, jungle, whatever it was, there was some kind of sample or something that had a thread that connected back connected all music together, really. 
So it was important to play that before the band will play and after you play the mix of everything. And what that did, I think, to a lot of musicians was when they were able to see people dance into their music, it kind of also adjusted the music they were making because we were kind of giving a space to musicians who may be playing in, you know, South Bank or some other place or Ronnie's and these places which were a bit more kind of straight ahead jazz places. But their own music they were making that wasn't getting platformed, we were open to that. We were like, yeah, bring it, you know, you, know, you don't get to play, yeah, bring it. Experimental stuff. And so when you start to see people dancing um, to your music, it affects how you perceive what you're doing. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the jazz dancers from like the 80s, so like IDJ and these, and look them up, IDJ and these mm -hmm. kind of jazz dance scene that we had, and these guys were like 16, 17. They weren't, you know, big people they are now, but they were like just dancing to jazz. Mm -hmm. A lot of the musicians who were making their music didn't even know that people were dancing to their music. So certain tunes you hear and you think, wow, that's a, a, like a tears up the dance floor. The musician was making it, wasn't even making it for that. And they were like mind blown when they actually got right. interviewed and showed people dancing to their music. Chip Career said that about New York City. Didn't right, yeah. exactly. I couldn't believe people were dancing to it. And, and you think, you know, it's, it's weird with, with hip hop even, like with samples and how people are using them and how it's made into this music, people didn't, un, you know, a lot of people didn't understand this thing. So for us, it was important that there was this element. And it wasn't always about dance because sometimes it's about a kind of, Movement, like you're saying, so it isn't like this thing of when you think of dancing, this kind of you know, it has to be you're in your zone and dancing. Sometimes it's just rocking, you know, and just like a very kind of hip hop style, you know, rocking to certain bits, you know, just something that makes you to move in that moment, or it might be a moment where you're making noise to the you know, to the band and stuff like that, because not all of the music was had the sensibility of that kind of mm -hmm. the dancing, but um. What was interesting was, as the music became more danceable, um, so you started to, you know, a lot of bands were influenced by broken beats, so people like, um, uh, what's the name, Yusuf Kamal, all these kind of people, you know, even before that, you know, vibration stuff, you could dance to it, all that stuff was really kind of, and now, when you listen to across the whole jazz scene, on their albums, their, their music is danceable. But I still believe, and I, we have a, a club night as well, called Room for Movement, which is, you know, very general club night. And I'm always trying to invite the musicians to come down to see their music played and then see people dance to it. Because, it, you know, not only does it affect the way they make it, but it also affects how they mix it. Because the, one of the problems with not going, <laughs> this is a kind of side issue, but one of the problems with not going to places where your music is played in a dance context alongside other dance records is that the mixes are light. Mm. and you know it's so it's this thing of you have to push the levels and you know because they're getting it mixed in a kind of way to the mm. sound of sonics of jazz where it's like no, you need to go to a dance and get it mixed to that level well this is a you know it's an interesting thing about one of the reasons why Moses Boyd's Ride Aid Shuffle sounded so big was because Kieran Hebden Fortet mixed it for him right um, and definitely I think some of the other musicians in that world be listening harder to you. Um, <laughs> we'll have one more thing and then we'll we'll wrap up and move to to you good people. Yes please. So I think um I think from what you're describing there, I think it describes very well mm -hmm. the fact that very often music that makes you dance is music that touches you in some some way. It has to touch you and give you a feeling and a vibe that moves your soul mm -hmm. so to speak and so I think even when you're talking about the mixing and the weight that's very important because for example when when you come to um, reggae and dance hall um, if the music isn't played at a volume where you can feel the vibration and thing it doesn't make you feel like you want to dance mm -hmm. it's when you actually can feel it and you can because um, with, with the music, you feel it vibrating. Even when it comes to soca music, when you, when you go to carnival here, you go to carnival here and you feel the carnival when you pass the sound systems. But you don't necessarily feel it when the steel pan passing by in the same, same way. But you go to carnival in Trinidad, and when the steel pan, because you're talking about 
Not a hundred pans, a hundred people playing pan. And some people playing five bass pan around it. So the same way that you feel the vibration of the music, that's how you feel the vibration of the pans when they're passing you. And I know that sometimes I've been, been to jazz clubs and when the music turn up and you can feel it, you, you actually get that intimate connection with the music again. And I think also, um, I haven't been to rave dances, but from what I'm hearing, it's, it's, the, it's the feeling, the frequency that people tune into. So I think it's that thing about when it touch you. Bob Marley said, when music hit you, you feel no pain. But you feel it though. Mm. And I think that's the important thing. Yes, it? I yeah. think vib uh, sound as vibrational instruction is mm. a lovely way to leave this part of the panel, which has been like a proper joy, I have to say. So before we ask some questions, can we just say a big thank you and a big round of applause? Yeah. I know, I know it's not easy to be the first person to ask a question, but if you do, we'll be like very grateful. Oh yes, okay then. So we've got a question here, and then we'll go to you. Yes, question or observation, whatever you want. Um, thank you so much. That was really interesting. Um, two of the topics that you kind of have all touched on: one is heritage, and one is safety. Um, is dance for any of you? This question is for: Is dance the space in which you can express and connect with your heritage safely? Who would like to answer that first? You guys are me. <laughs> <laughs> sure, right. um, I think more and more it's become it's unspeakable now, subconsciously. I've definitely moved away from being, you know, that kind of reserved, recoiled by the wall to now when it comes to a, a, an event or an environment, you know, it would be very often I would just like I just wonder for my own. And, you know, if, if it's like a, a big club, whatever, we'll just kind of seek out or find those kind of sounds that I feel connected to in a way. And then within five minutes or ten minutes, I probably open my eyes and my friends or someone I know will be around me. And I think it speaks to that, that kind of subconscious relationship we have because very often when, you kind of, when, I, when I leave or I find the track, there are elements of maybe hip life, high life, UK funky, within maybe an, an eight, nine minute tune, which I kind of just pick up and I go and dig further and, and, and realise that it hits me more on a personal level than I realised in a moment in the dance. And when you can also uh, kind of remix maybe dances that I improvise from like maybe your parents might have done to like more contemporary stuff things mm -hmm. that's when you kind of really feel like it's moved and it's become this journey where it's not just you and your friends but it's a way for you and your peers to almost realize or recognize that this is, this is a safe space where maybe your parents had that in the, the hall party and home setting but you're getting to in, embrace and feel that with peers who kind of had that kind of same lineage or relationship to music so that yeah that direction or that kind of relationship is, is massive for me. Justin. Sorry can I speak with that as well um, that's definitely because I guess talk from a personal um, perspective it was Soka and Calypso really I mean what we call Kaiso which is old school Soka growing up and going to family parties and stuff like that I think when I got to rave to Soka there was it was a it was very unique to anything else I was going to. And um, there was this connection to, it's like, so I'm born in Hammersmith, I'm a Londoner, um, West London. And it's an interesting, it's interesting being like, I guess black British, you might want to call it, because we, we grew up with our parents calling back home the Caribbean. And for me, I've always called back home the Caribbean. We, we have never said, I didn't live there, you know, but, but that's how we felt. And, our, and when I, especially, we always listen to Soka, like in house and stuff, but when I started going to Soka things, my kind of connection to people who had that same experience 
was kind of heightened, even though a lot of my peers had that experience. But going to somewhere where the dances were, you know, were quite unique. The, the language was quite unique, you know. You, and that was across islands. So, like, you know, you might talk about waking up, like, for instance, right, which is a Bayesian term, which is just like a, a harder wine. It's like a faster, harder wine as everything gets faster and harder. Um, but that whole connection to the Caribbean was, you have, you know, food, you have music, but dance it was, was a big part of that as well. And it, I guess, in a way of talking about safe spaces, because you have um, a shared experience of people, there is a safety in that, even if you're not all from the same place. Mm -hmm. and I, I, safety is a strange word. It is a strange word because it means a lot of things, you know, and it, the meaning evolves. But I, I think in terms of, you know, if... if I'll give you an example. If, for instance, a soca tune is played, I hate it to hear soca in general parties. Because I always felt that soca was always seen as thing as hot, 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 and people would always joke and do funny, like, almost taking the mick kind of dances. So actually being in a space where everybody, this, this music is, you know, part of heritage and, and you know, people are taking it seriously. Whether they're part of heritage or not, they're taking it seriously meant it was a safe space that I could express myself because in, people always look to me or maybe my peers to dance to this music because it's your music as opposed to being in a place where, so, you know, that more connection kind of thing. And in finding those situations, I wouldn't dance to music. You'd think I'd be glad to hear it, but I wasn't. So there is a kind of connection between safety, I guess, mm. and heritage and being in those spaces. Thank you for your question. We'll go to this question. I'm slightly, also slightly conscious of time, so we'll go to you at the back and then maybe... We'll get some, we've got some food and stuff and then we can come and have more like one-on-one -on -one conversations. Feel free to come and talk to us. We're not going anywhere immediately. And then come and dance with us after. <laughs> yes, your question, please. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, um, oh, sorry. We're going to go to the front first. Let me try to frame my question. So I remember when I was a kid, I already felt that passion and that I love dance. And uh, when I was a kid, you can do it so freely. Mm. You have no constraints and you don't have any limit to that. I think kids are the most free human being. And uh, when you're a kid, you, you don't really need music. You, you, you body, you, you just feel it, and you can just move whatever way you, you want. However, we realize when we grew, grow up, you just gradually have more and more limits, and you're more and more self-aware. And so now, when, when I, I still like dancing, but when I dance now, you feel like you, you probably need the the best time and the best location, the best music, the, 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 the right music mm -hmm. to dance with. So uh, how would you like uh, go back to like a free child? Like how do you like undo the damage of growing up? Okay, Ooh. who would like to oh. <laughs> 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 oh, I saw you looking at me. <laughs> um, well, the thing is, Dance is, a, is, is um, an activity that is about the individual. And I guess part of what you're talking about is the fact that society kind of puts a, a, a certain value to dance and a certain value to cultural activities. And so therefore dance then occupies a certain space. It's either... Um, it's either your professional dancer or your social dancer. If you're a social dancer, then you're supposed to dance within specific places, like if it's a disco or if it's or if it's a party, etc. And then, but then also within that, there's a there's kind of there's a hierarchy of how the dance goes because dance is seen as a feminized activity, so they expect women to dance, men not supposed to dance, um, until a certain time, when they've drank enough, or it's getting towards the end, and so it's about getting ready for a pickup. And so, so therefore, that put, play, positions dance in a particular way, where people then become conscious of when they're dancing, others are spectators watching them dance rather than being um, participants 
if you're professional, then it's about being on stage and performing and being of a certain standard and quality. But then also, when we come off stage, it's, it's about you supposed to be the one that leads the dance everywhere because you're the professional dancer. And, and the thing is, um, it doesn't take into account that um, all of us have different differences in how we relate to dance. Me personally, and Casper do laugh, but I'm a very shy person. And so, so <laughs> yeah, most people, they laugh when they hear that. But I can perform when I'm on stage because that's my job. And I turn on the switch and I perform when, I'm, when I know it's time to perform. But when it's personal, it's my personal time and I'm in a space where it's a party, unless I'm with the right crowd who I know and I feel comfortable and safe with, with them, I feel, um, I feel shy. And so this thing of security and insecurity, it, it happens all the time. Mm. Where um, for the women, it will be about judgment. Judgment by other women as to, oh, she's performing for the man then, or she's showing off, or she, she, um, she's doing it for some other reason. And it will be for some other man then, yes, she's performing for me, and that's why you tend to find a lot of the female dancers in particular, they dance and they find their husband through the dance. But as soon as he gets her, he doesn't want her to dance anymore. <laughs> because, because there's a way in which we view dance. Dance as kind of like the audition towards other things. So maybe the answer to your question is about finding places where you feel um, with kindred spirits, Free. whether that's like, you know, kindred spirits in relation to sexuality mm, or culture mm -hmm. or shared interests. And maybe that, that childlike person is liberated in places yeah. where you're with like-minded souls. I think Thank you for your question. Sorry to interrupt, I can't stop myself. I think, and I wanted to hear Indy talk about this, there is one answer to that question as pertains to rape culture. Ecstasy. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Which so we're talking about a psycho. Yeah. No, seriously, it's not. It's not a joke. Yeah. This is the cure for emotional constipation. The rise of that, the cusp for of the dancing. Dancing. Yeah. And also, like dancing, it's uh, when you're doing anything that's creative, you're exposing yourself. So it takes an element of courage and emotional courage for some people to actually be able to express themselves mm -hmm. like a lot of the producers they're behind screens and they're in solitude making amazing music but there's a huge difference between that kind of creativity which is amazing mm -hmm. to actually expressing yourself on the dance floor mm -hmm. um, and that's where I do think drugs play a huge part and I think you know you, you can see the difference and as drugs have changed of course the dancers have changed there's a lot mm. more stumbling going on <laughs> 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 yeah. um, it's not good dance drugs well, well, yeah, it's not great <laughs> compared to like with, with ecstasy which is kind of a fast track route to your inner child do you know what mm. I mean and that mm. feeling of liberation and connectedness with everyone in the music means that you're able to get to that kind of place of pure expression mm. in half an hour mm -hmm. you know but then you see the thing is um, the, the pharmacology that you know pharmacology in terms of you, the use of drugs is something that um, you will find some, some use in, in, um, within the dancehall space and reggae space but people don't need, need that they f can find it because it's more akin for me personally it's more akin to when you're in church and when you're in church and you, you're singing the choruses over and over till you become mesmerized and you feel yourself being lifted and you no longer care about what others are thinking. That's what happens within the dance hall space as well. And so it's when you, but part of it is about being around the right people, being secure with your crowd. Like when you say, you open your eyes and and you know say there's um some of your 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 brethren them your crew are around you so you know that you're safe you're safe to to leave and transcend mm. and come back mm. 
because you know that there's others who are watching out for you in that sense. To leave, to transcend and to come back. Um, mm -hmm. One last question, quick question and a quick answer, otherwise you won't have time to eat the nice yeah. grapes. That <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'll, I have to speed through um, my entire life. Uh, just one thing, actually amazing uh, conversation, lots of subtle things that are not really written down anywhere um, that people said today, so amazing for putting it on. Incredible. Also to say that Chad's um, refreshing also room for me in incredible spaces. Um, fortunately for me, I lost my emotional constipation as a 14 year old white Northwest London boy in the Electric Ballroom, which is a very black boogie club, both in the jazz room upstairs and in the boogie room downstairs with Paul Anson. And Room for Move was that natural kind of um, continuum or narrative through that whole thread of all those clubs. But I was also raising the drummer bass as well. And I guess my question, the, the two very small questions, um, one of which is about spatial awareness. I found spatial awareness is very different in different kind of clubs. Mm. Um, like for instance in, in the jazz, the heavy jazz dancing club where I'd get taken apart by Jerry from IDJ and then come back six months later and take him on and do okay. Um, I found actually weirdly, perversely, the, the blacker the club, the better the spatial awareness in the club because people were very much more aware of their movements, were more controlled in their movements. Um, so there's never any issue of crushing or problematic things. There might be other things going on, but in terms of spatial awareness from the dance floor, it was a very, it's always been extremely healthy for me. And more in the blacker clubs, the spatial awareness has been better. I don't know if you, there's a comment on that. And secondly, the one thing I find about dance now, and maybe in the UK it's a little bit different, in the UK there's always been club dancers that separate between the social and the professional dancers. Some of the classic dancers like Clive Clark were professional dancers and club dancers simultaneously. And we used to DJ at the place where you could tell the difference between the contemporary dancers who stood very upright and the club dancers who stood more kind of kind of booked. Um, and the second question, so it's kind of, is spatial awareness very different in different clubs? And the second one, very short, was just to say, um, in terms of, I feel that people learn to dance a bit more through video or, or going to classes now, yeah. rather than learning in a much softer way of learning with their friends in clubs, where they're a little bit less, like now I see kids dance and I know where classes they've been, they do certain hip hop movements, certain, jazz dance things, they learn in a certain way. Whereas it used to feel like it was a little bit more organic in its growth. And do you feel that's the case? So sorry, it's a couple of questions. Sorry, no, 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 thank you, Paul. Thank you. Um, yes, go ahead. Sorry. So I'll go second point first. I think that's because there are less clubs. Um, because where do you go to learn these dances? Where we didn't have the internet, you know, back in the 90s. You know, the internet was, you know, it was in its infancy. So we didn't have these videos, there was no YouTube. Where, how do people learn starts? They went to clubs and previous to that. I think with the demise of clubs and, and also what you see, even on the dance scenes you see now, like say Just the Boo, which is and that kind of, you know, forever dance, which is in Amsterdam and in and the old in Paris. There's a big house dance scene, which kind of bleeds into other music as well, jazz, and it bleeds into other things. But with that, a lot of the dances that you see those people Dancing, it's very, they, they study their moves like by themselves, they learn, it, it's very, it's, it isn't in the organic way of how you see people. Sorry, Well, you know, uh, yeah, I think there is, you know, there aren't, there aren't a lot of these spaces. I think we take for granted what we, grew up with, in a way, um, where you, you did, you went to dances and you, you learned the dances by actually just being around people in that way. I think now there's a lot of competitions, there's a lot of places where house dancers go, but the kind of general dancing. There's TikTok. There's, yeah, there's TikTok, there's all these things. And there's a lot of people doing moves, you know, they're doing moves as opposed to a lot more kind of organic stuff. I mean, it's, it, that's, that's the way I feel about it. But to the spatial thing, um, it's interesting because when I, um, again, I'm talking about the 90s, you know, I always will. Um, when I raved a lot, and in those days, there were black clubs and there were um, white clubs. And it wasn't in a way that it sounds, now that sounds like horrific, but actually it was based along music lines more than anything else. So it, it wasn't like you didn't have white people in black clubs and vice versa, but it was based upon the type of music that was being played. And some of the black clubs were owned by black people as well. And these things which you don't really have now. Now, what I found was, talking about drugs and um, you know, substances, the drink culture in black clubs is a lot less. 
And because even when we used to put, put on parties, a lot of parties in the nineties, the clubs didn't like us because people weren't drinking. Mm. And mm. so the kind of spatial awareness, and that does kind of go into spatial awareness as well, of the kind of, I'm just going to dance around and don't care who's around me. You didn't really get that so much. Not that you didn't get drunk people in black clubs, but they kind of stood out. Like, oh, you know, they, they were the people who people just kind of push to the side. And even in a soca cl club where people, you could see people mashing up together in fives. And they, you might think, oh, spatial awareness. When people want to dance by themselves, no one's knocking them. You know, it's, it, mm. that's intentional. So there was, there was a difference. I mean, I, I'm, I'm kind of pricing it down to things like the, the drink and substance culture, which wasn't as prevalent in black clubs. Um, and there might be other reasons, but that was my observation at the time where, where there was a lot of drinking. And even in like, house parties where maybe there was a lot of drinking, you'd find that people just didn't, you lose spatial awareness because you become more, I guess, you know, into yourself and you might have that thing. But um, mm -hmm. that's, that's kind of, I mean, I, I, that's what I put it down to. I don't know, you know, outside of that what it was, mm -hmm. but it, there was definitely a difference, mm -hmm. you know. I, yeah, I, I do know that. Because I've got to get people to eat this food. So mm -hmm. listen, I'm going to intervene. There's so thank you for that you read so much that they, we've got lots to talk about there, but don't stop talking. So here's the idea, right? We've got a table of snacks and fruit juice and fruit, and I'm going to bring it out here. I'm going to stick it right here, right where Jerry's microphone is. <laughs> the panel is going to stand up and move their chairs back. We're going to put the table here. All of you lot are going to come down here and jump on it and jump on the panel and talk to them with your mouth full of fruit and get rid of as much of it as possible because it's going to perish. And then we've got about 20, 20 minutes. Then we're going to go Pied Piper like to the pub over the road. Please do all join us, even if only for one drink. Yeah. Let's continue the conversation. Let's eat some fruit and drink some juice and keep going. And then we'll also have some music when we get over there, okay? So you're with me? You're going to stick yeah, with us? Excellent. Yeah. All Thank right. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.